Hey, welcome back to the Naval News, everybody. We're gonna begin talking about some hypersonic weapons uh, that are in development with the United States right now. At the very top there, you see an artist render of the Hawk. That's the hypersonic uh, air breathing weapon concept. That program officially came to an end in uh, January of 2023, it just ended. And they began a new one called Mohawk. This is the uh, more opportunities hypersonic air breathing uh, weapon concept. And you can see a picture of one of the concepts slung beneath the B-52 bomber there. Uh, this, this program has been in operation for a couple years now and uh, this year it's funded for another 60 million dollars which is a relatively low fund for um, any weapon system but it's still in the early development phases so they may not need that much money um, we do have an operational hypersonic weapon that uh, I should remind you of uh, Raytheon successfully tested their version of this hypersonic weapon all the way back in September 2021 over a year ago so we do have something that that we can go forward with now, but this is a, um, a different program entirely. I believe DARPA is working with Lockheed Martin on this Hawk and Mohawk design. So know that we have lots of different programs running in parallel and we're making a lot of progress. Uh, I have to you know, remind everybody that we are behind. We have two major near peer competitors, well, one's at least near peer, uh, that already have operational deployed hypersonic weapons in the field. Uh, they've both demonstrated, both those countries have demonstrated hypersonic speeds, uh, but that's about it. Not necessarily uh, any capability beyond achieving those speeds. And, and what I mean is uh, accuracy is really still a question can the target be moving and still be hit uh, that's that's not been demonstrated but we're working on uh, concepts that can do much more than what our near peers have already demonstrated here's the data sheet coming out of DARPA and this is for the Hawk system this is what just ended and some of the key points you want to take away from this are it's an ad advanced air vehicle different configurations what works do what doesn't we are using a hydrocarbon scramjet so we still have that uh, happening as a fuel source. Uh, thermal management continues to be a problem, trying to find the right materials that can be on the nose and in the body of these uh, air vehicles so they don't disintegrate at these intense pressures and speeds. And then finally, something that's affordable. So yeah, we can make a great weapon, but if it's too expensive to use, obviously Congress is never gonna fund it. So we are keeping price in mind at the very first early stages of these Hawks and Mohawk developments. Here is something not many people know about. We also have a hypersonic attack cruise missile. Uh, this one here, credit to Air Power. He posted this on uh, Twitter a little while ago, so I got it off that. Thank you, sir. Uh, follow him at at mill uh, underscore STD. And you can see this flight test has been funded year over year since 2021. The current testing uh, is due to end in third quarter of this year. And so we're not just uh, doing you know long range airstrike, we have this cruise missile hypersonic capability too. I look forward to see what this one looks like because this one might have more of a naval uh, capability than the, than the other weapons have. But we'll see, all this stuff is very early, early stage. And we also are developing one in-house. The Air Force Research Laboratory is building their own version. This one's called Mayhem. This is a hypersonic multi-mission uh, ISR, that's Intelligence Surveillance Reconnaissance and Strike Platform. Uh, courtesy of the War Zone, credit to Joseph Theravik for writing a great story on this. You can go read it over there on the War Zone if you want. But this one's all developed in-house. It has a $334 million budget. And because it's in-house, the program is funded out to 2028. So it doesn't have to be re renewed annually or every other year like uh, a lot of these other programs are. So this one's already funded. Uh, it's being tested out of the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. So hey, if you live in Ohio near the, near the Air Force Base, keep your eyes in the sky at night. You might see some interesting lights. Uh, or maybe not, depends on how they're, they're operating this. But just know that we have, th this one's kind of special because it's not just a one-way trip weapon. This one is a, is a vehicle that can achieve these hypersonic speeds and complete a peacetime mission like ISR. Very important stuff in peacetime. So this might be a very uh, effective and, you know, usable hypersonic vehicle versus building a lot of weapons that maybe never get used like ICBMs never get used. All right, let's shift gears a little bit over to France. Uh, the, the, the French Navy or the French government uh, funded or had a Paris Naval Conference uh, 
a couple weeks ago, and we had the chief of naval operations from three NATO countries there talking about the Ukraine conflict. So here you can see Admiral uh, Mike Gildy. Uh, next to me, you have Admiral Pierre Vandier. And on the end is the Royal Navy uh, Ben K or Ben Key. And they are talking about some of the lessons learned over the past year uh, in the Black Sea from a naval perspective. Now, these guys are at the top level of their navies. They're not even operational, so certainly not theater or tactical. Their, you know, their overall view is very, uh, very boilerplate because they don't get into the details like an operational commander would. So I didn't get a lot out of their talk, but some of the key things that they brought up is... Uh, and this was the American Admiral Gildy said, the will to fight has become the largest force multiplier in modern warfare. What we're seeing in Ukraine, because they're fighting for their own sovereignty and survivability, their, their life, if you will, they have a strong will to fight versus their opponents who are just there because they're under orders to be there, right? And so the uh, will to fight is uh, becoming a very, or being used as a very effective tool in modern warfare. The Odessa port, which is Ukraine's last large uh, Black Sea port is still open. And it's still open for a number of reasons. One, I should give credit to Turkey for negotiating a deal with Russia for not you know, blockading that port and allowing, allowing grain shipments to come in or out of the port to feed um, the world. Because those of you that may not know this, Ukraine is one of the largest uh, grain exporters in the world. And if that gets cut off, a lot of countries won't have enough food to feed their people. So the consequences of closing this final port would be felt globally. Okay. And that was um, spearheaded, if you will, by, by Turkey in terms of uh, discussions. But they're also talking about how effective mine warfare is. Mine warfare is often unseen and untalked about. It's not as fancy as fighter planes and hypersonic missiles, and it is key to keeping the Odessa port open. So um, both sides, Ukraine and Russia, have used mine warfare effectively as area denial uh, tactics and employment in the Black Sea. And sweeping these mines after this conflict is over is going to take a long time, both at sea and, and, and on land. And then finally, the unmanned surface vehicles were used effectively by Ukraine for the first time in the modern war um, against a belligerent. Uh, there, there were some uh, examples of an unmanned surface vehicle being used off the coast of Yemen. I've been reminded of that multiple times by YouTube chat. So those cases, uh, you know, being exceptional, uh, this is the first, you know, consistent two large forces using unmanned surface vehicles to essentially attack each other's fleets. And so they think that that's going to be the future. Mine warfare, unmanned vehicles, whether on the surface, air, or subsurface, uh, are, are going to be at the pointy end of the spear in future conflicts. Really good um, conference. Uh, you can probably watch it on YouTube. I just read about it here from the Naval News, and credit to uh, Vassiver for writing this article about that. Let's shift gears back home here to the United States. We actually have some good information coming out of our shipyards, which I love to see that because there's so much bad news, it seems. Um, the budget has been approved, apparently, uh, for $17 billion to upgrade 20 Arleigh Burke Flight 2 Alpha ships to Baseline 10. Baseline 10 is a um, an improved combat system and radar combined with radar and other sensors to enhance its ability to detect, track, and destroy ballistic missiles. And so, you know, having 20 additional assets with improved uh, theater defense ballistic missile capability uh, is, is a big step forward. Now, each one of these ships is going to take about two years to upgrade. Okay. And it's going to cost a little bit, well, yeah, a little bit less than building a new ship. And because we're doing this in conjunction with also building three new ships a year, it makes sense both financially and from a dry dock availability to upgrade and build new ships with this baseline nine and baseline 10 capability at the same time. Also, um, a big part of this upgrade is this new electronic warfare improvement package. This has been in the works for a long time and more of it is becoming more and more public. Um, we can actually talk a little bit about how the Block 3 electronic warfare suite that's going to be installed on these ships and is already on some ships at sea already has increased effectiveness in its frequency range and it has finally non-kinetic um, 
de destruction capability. It can it can destroy objects with its energy focus, which is um, apparently a, a, a new capability. This is what that uh, array looks like. This is it in a in a testing facility. Uh, obviously, you see the technician there looking at it. But what this array apparently can do, and there's no details on this, but it can project energy in a knife-like fashion with such concentration, it can break apart a physical object. We have no idea at what range this happens. It could be very short, it's probably not very long, um, but the idea of using what is an electronic warfare suite and uh, making it into almost a weapon uh, even though it may be a point defense and short range weapon, giving it some offensive uh, ECM capability at range is, is, is very good. And I think they're smart, they're right in not publishing anything about this other than we have the capability because we don't want other nations that like to copy our technology to get this. This is an advantage we have. Just like our submarines are a huge advantage we have, this capability is new and uh, and we don't want to share it. <laughs> All right, let's look at the uh, fleets around the world. Uh, we still have the Ronald Reagan in Japan and uh, doing their maintenance availability, which means that they're ripping things apart, putting them back together, you know, you know replacing stuff, making sure everything works fine. Uh, the USS America is in the Philippine Sea still, sailing around. The Nimitz has left Singapore and moved into the South China Sea, where the Macon Island was, full of Marines and stuff. Now those Marines with the Macon Island ARG are in Singapore enjoying some you know, well-deserved time off in a beautiful port. Like I told you last week, Singapore, very popular port, really with everybody. You know, George H.W. Bush is over in uh, the Med. Actually, it's like the Ionian Sea technically, but in the Med, generally speaking. Last week, she had finished an exercise with the Israelis. Uh, something I learned since that exercise is the director of the CIA was also visiting Israel with uh, the State Department. Uh, Anthony Blinken was over there at the same time. And that resulted in, or happened in near coincidence with, an Israeli drone attack on a drone factory in Iran. So without saying that they had anything to do with that, it seems interesting to me that we had an exercise with the Israeli Navy in increasing our relationships and, and working together with them. Uh, the CIA and the State Department were, were visiting Israel at the same time. And the result of those actions ended in a drone attack on Iran. Now, Iran obviously very upset about this, um, saying, you know, accusing, you know, it as an act of war. But those drones are being supplied to Russia and used in Ukraine right now. And so that's the relationship between that. Now, what I don't know, and this is the question for you watching this, is that an act of war? Because it seems like it would be when you have one nation attack another, uh, even though it's a military target, military factory, building military drones that are being used in an act of conflict. Uh, you know, in a, in a country nearby, you know, is what's, what's the consequences of that internationally? We have a lot of very smart viewers on this channel. Please educate us as to what are the consequences of Israel doing a drone attack on another country that's not at war, but is supplying war supplies to a country that is at war. Well, technically not at war. I should remind everybody, Russia-Ukraine conflict is still technically not a declared war. It is a, I think they're calling it a special operation in Russia, and Ukraine is calling it, please stop attacking us. That's what they're calling it. So please put in the comments what you think about the consequences of Israel attacking Iran in this and how that escalatory action may play out. Finally, let's move over to uh, the Western Atlantic. We have the Dwight D. Eisenhower is at sea in the Vey Capes with uh, Kearsarge and the USS Bataan. Looks like they're getting ready for a pre-overseas movement workup that's very common to happen in that area of the world. The George H.W. Bush has been deployed in the meds since August of last year. So they're coming up on seven months. They could certainly operate much longer than seven months in the med, especially with so many ports to pull in and resupply. They could stay there practically indefinitely, forward deployed. But uh, I believe they are scheduled to be relieved at some point. It is likely that the Dwight D. Eisenhower will be uh, that, that relief. We'll see. We'll see who it is. All right. And the U.S. Navy published some fantastic photos on their site of uh, our ships at sea. Here we have one of our 
uh, supply ships that can supply two ships at a time, which is great. We've been doing this for decades. We're very good at this, but this is not easy just because we have a lot of experience doing this. Each time you do this type of resupply at sea, moving forward through the water and seas are moving left and right winds and everything. Uh, you gotta be very careful and follow the procedure. But I love the fact that we can do this as well as we do. So here we have a refuel getting in position for both the carrier and uh, the ship that the camera is being set on. A lot of you may ask, you know, if it's a nuclear carrier, why does it need to be refueled? Well, do you see all those planes on the deck? Those aren't nuclear powered planes. They need jet fuel. There's also a lot of other engines on board these ships besides the nuclear engine providing steam, you know, to make the propeller go forward and the turbine generator go around. So you do need fresh water, you need fuel um, of all different grades. And that's what we're seeing here. They also, and this one shocked me and I did not post, I'm just letting you guys know the most accurate photo of this, but this is a photo of one of the consoles inside the E3 Century. Yeah, uh, they, they put this out in 4K and I was like, yeah. Um, the one that I did not post had labels on this display and I did not want to share that with everybody, but I did want to point out, look at what the inside of the E3 centuries look like. They they're tracking in this case, this is operating in the Southern black sea going East, West, East, West, looking North into, um, the conflict with Russia and Ukraine, and they can track drones and aircraft here. Uh, and then, and coordinate. They have a lot of communications equipment on board these E3. They can, you know, contact uh, theater commanders, NATO theater commanders on the ground and uh, tell them what's going on and kind of keep the big picture of what's happening over the Black Sea and a little bit into, into Ukraine as well. Really good capability. We've had the E3 for years, but this is the first high resolution uh, photo I've seen of the consoles while they're in operation. And uh, you can even see if you zoom in on this video, all the different uh, modes that the guy can select into. Uh, but keep in mind, uh, I wouldn't even post what the Navy posted on, on this video. So big shout out to all the men and women of the Navy doing the job. Here you can see this ship is lined up behind the supply ship with her equipment already flayed out on the deck, ready to get her turn in to get some resupply. You have the crew there kind of chatting you know, they're mustered, they've already had their safety brief, they're ready to go. And uh, just a big tip of the hat to all of them. Uh, being at sea for this period of time is very stressful and difficult. And operations like this are, frankly, they're dangerous. But I, if I could just speak to the men and women for a moment, if you get a chance to see this video, you will remember these moments, these deployments and operations like this the rest of your life. So even though you may be having a bad day, just know that this is gonna become a memory that you'll often look back on and maybe even tell your kids about someday. So anyway, that's long enough for us today. Thank you very much for watching. I will see you guys. Oh, we have the new uh, sub brief or the new ship brief coming out on Friday. Definitely check out the Patreon, please. And uh, thanks everybody for supporting me over there. Have a great one. Bye, 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 bye.